About four years ago, my grandmother died in her house. She died of cancer, and it was a peaceful death. Then about four months after that, my step-grandfather died in the house. This one was a bit more brutal. He had gone into a big depression after my grandmother had died and stopped talking to the whole family, except for one of my uncles, his son, also the one who found him. My grandfather stopped taking all of his medications, which was terrible for him because he had hep C, diabetes, and a few other disorders. He was found on the floor in the hallway, and he had been, been there for about three days. There was blood everywhere, as he was internally bleeding, and he began to cough up and throw up blood. After both of my grandparents' deaths, my family took over the house. We renovated everything. We had to put a new carpet in. The old carpet was torn out because my grandfather had hep C, and his blood went everywhere. When we first moved in, my mum and I liked to sleep in the living room on the couches because our rooms were being renovated. Also, the cable wasn't set up yet, and neither was the internet, and we would watch DVDs on the living room TV. My mum and I would usually sleep out there at different times, because my mum works graveyard shifts at a vet hospital. However, every time we slept on the couches, something strange would happen. Almost every night at 2.43am, I would wake up terrified, covered in sweat, breathing heavily, on the brink of tears. I knew I had woken up from a nightmare every time, but I never remembered them. This happened probably 20 times before I decided I was no longer going to fall asleep in the living room. So I slept in my bedroom, but the only thing that stopped was waking up at the same time every night. The nightmares never stopped. I was constantly haunted by these nightmares. I've always had nightmares, but they never happened as often as they did when I moved into the house. One night, while my mom was off work, she had asked me if I wanted to watch a movie with her in the living room. It was pretty late, and I knew I would fall asleep if I did watch the movie, so I said no. When she asked why, I explained to her, and she kind of looked shocked. She said she had been experiencing the same thing but during the day, and sometimes at night when she was off of work. It was the same time during the day, 2.43pm, and at night it was 2.43am. We were sort of relieved that we had both been experiencing this but also sort of scared because we had no idea what was going on. One afternoon, while my mom was sleeping out in the living room, she felt someone punch her in her side. She woke up, thinking it was my dad or my brother messing with her. She lifted her head up and said, What's your problem? And nobody was there. She walked all throughout the house, and not a single person was there. It couldn't have been one of our dogs. She felt a distinct human hand punching her in the ribs. So basically, my mom decided to never sleep on the couch again. Three years have passed since then, and we never did sleep on the couch during that period. And nothing really bothered us again, except for the nightmares that persisted. My boyfriend, who's been with me for five years, even says that I've had more nightmares in this house than before we moved in. But about a month ago, my dad came home with a huge 4K TV. So of course, being the big movie buffs we are, my mum and I wanted to watch movies there. Now, when I watch movies out in the living room late at night, I usually stay up past 2.43am, just in case, and nothing usually happens. Except the other night, at exactly 2.43am, I was awake and my mum had fallen asleep. All of a sudden, I start to hear a whimper, and at first I thought it was one of my dogs wanting to go outside. But then I realised it was my mom when the whimper grew louder into a full scream. I woke her up and she was very confused and very scared. I told her she was screaming and she said she had a dream where she was laying down next to me on the couch. Like she was just then. But I was asleep. She said she was unable to move and was trying to scream because she felt I was in danger. But she couldn't get the words out. Then a shadowy hand grabbed my face. That's when she woke up. My mom and I are the only ones who experienced the nightmare and the specific times that the nightmares happen in the living room. Although when my older brother was crashing on our couch for a while, he claimed to have experienced some weird stuff too. Like the feeling that someone was watching him sleep. We've all experienced things moving on their own. Like this antique kerosene lamp 
we have on a shelf that just touches the ceiling, that flew off and shattered for no reason. We've actually been losing forks too. I don't know what that means, but forks just go missing all the time, and we're down to about three or four forks, as opposed to the ten we used to have. Our TV turns off at random times without anyone touching the remote, and we used a warranty to get a new TV, and the new TV still does the same thing. It's not a power issue, where the TV just loses power, or the plug isn't plugged in all the way. It's like the TV screen says powering off, and then turns off. We get random scents out of nowhere. My mom usually smells this old soap that smells like a grandmother, where I usually get a smell like something is burning and it gives me a headache. My dad always smells something that he only describes as shit. The smells are unprompted. Usually only one person can smell it. This has been slowly progressing over the course of at least four years. We're not really sure what's going on. I think it's my grandfather not happy that we're here. What do you think? This happened about seven years ago, when I was 13 or 14. I was in my old house in California. It was probably around 1am. I was sitting on my couch watching TV late at night, alone in my living room. There was a big window next to the couch that was about five feet off the ground outside, and the ground outside the window was dirt. Out of nowhere, I heard breathing and footsteps outside the window, and then someone tried to open the window. The window was shaking loudly, so loud that it woke up my mother. My mother said that it sounded like the whole house was shaking. I was paralyzed with fear and couldn't move. After a few seconds of the window shaking, the noises just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walk away, and I didn't hear the breathing fade. It just abruptly stopped. About three feet from the window was the gate to our backyard. It's the only way to get into the backyard without jumping through our neighbor's yards or jumping over a six foot fence that had a big thick bush the same height as the fence all along it. Also, on our side of the fence were multiple trees and other brushes. Basically, you'd make a lot of noise and have great difficulty getting over the fence. My mom sat in her bedroom trying to listen and my older brother was already awake in his bedroom. Both my parents' bedroom windows and my brother's bedroom window opened to the backyard, and on the other side of one of my parents' bedroom wall was the back porch. Right after I had heard these noises, my mother and brother both heard someone walking on the gravel outside their window, and someone walking on the porch. My brother said he saw lights outside of his window, like three or four flashlights pointing in random directions outside. My mother woke up my father, and he grabbed his gun and went to the sliding glass door that opens to the back porch. And he saw nobody, no lights or anything. My mom grabbed the phone and called the cops. Everyone except for my younger brother came out into the living room where I was. Now, I didn't hear the gate to the backyard open, nor did we hear anyone enter or exit the backyard. We were all intentionally quiet so that we could hear anything that was happening outside. Once everyone was in the living room, stuff got weird. All of a sudden, we heard noises on the roof. These were not footsteps. They weren't animals scurrying. The sounds were loud and bizarre, like a dragging noise. Multiple big objects were being dragged in random directions in our house. One big noise on one side of the house, then another on the other side. It was rapid and fast, like a rhythm. They had to have been caused by multiple people because they were so loud and they were on different sides of the roof. Then the noises stopped abruptly. After the noises on the roof stopped, nothing else happened. There was no way for a person to get on the roof unless they brought a ladder or climbed on the fence, then hopped up five feet onto the roof. We didn't hear anybody climb onto the roof either. We waited there for the police who then came and checked out the backyard. After the police did a search, they found absolutely no evidence of an attempted break-in. There were no footprints by the dirt next to the window, no footprints in the gravel outside the windows, no breaks in the bushes by the windows or by the fence, no damage to the window. 
The police told us what we heard were raccoons, which we all knew was ridiculous. A raccoon can't jump up a five foot wall and shake a window, nor could it make human sounding footprints on the porch or in the backyard, nor could it make the loud heavy noises we heard on the roof. We asked a few of our neighbours the next morning who all said they didn't hear anything, which was strange because all of the noises were incredibly loud. All we had to go off were the noises because all of the windows had blinds closed at the time. This whole time, we didn't hear any voices, nobody talking to each other, but there were definitely multiple people. My parents and I didn't see any lights, but my brother swears he did. To this day, we have no idea what happened or what was there that night. We never experienced anything like that after that night. I don't know if this was just some really good robbers or something else. If anyone has any ideas of what this could have been, that would help a lot. In 1986, a 39-year-old father of two teenage boys named Tom Hawks met a stunningly beautiful woman named Jackie, and they madly fell in love with each other. In 1989, they got married in front of 150 of their closest friends and family, and Jackie moved in with Tom and his sons after the marriage. Jackie had earlier met with an accident, which left her unable to bear kids. So she accepted the boys as her own, and the boys started to accept her as their mom. With time, this beautiful family of four gelled wonderfully, making their house a happy place. When their sons were old enough, they moved out of their house to start their own life, and they felt it was right for the time to enter their perfectly planned retirement. The couple planned to spend their post-retirement lives in a yacht, sailing around the sea. So putting in all their savings, they purchased a yacht. Although this yacht was not luxurious, they loved it dearly and named it Well Deserved. They spent the next two years sailing around the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of California, cherishing each other's company. When Jackie got the news that one of her sons was expecting a baby, she was elated and excited to have her grandchild in her hands. Thus, the couple felt it was time to return back to the land and be with their son. So in 2004, they decided to sell their yacht and move to Newport Harbour to stay with their son. In the November of the same year, the ad was considered by the Delian couple who finalised the deal in a couple of days. They told this news to their sons and told them they would follow up. With their sons expecting their call any time, they never got a call from their parents for over a couple of days. As this was completely unusual for them, they informed their uncle Jim, who was a retired police chief. When Jim heard about this, he drove to Newport Beach with his friend to see if the couple had actually sold the yacht or if they were still in it. He found well-deserved on the dock and decided to walk into it to see if his brother and his wife were inside. The yacht was completely not in order and the things inside it were a mess. This made Jim conclude that the yacht was sold as Tom and Jackie were an extremely orderly and tidy couple who took really good care of well-deserved. So he left a note to the new owner asking them to contact him as the previous owners went missing. When he was about to leave the area, Jim got a call from a 21-year-old woman named Jennifer Delian, saying that she got his note on the yacht. She confirmed that she and her husband Skylar had purchased the yacht from the Hawks, but just like Jim, they were trying to contact them, but they couldn't. She told them that there were a couple of controls on the boat that she didn't know how to use, and tried reaching out to Tom, but his whereabouts were not known. She also told Jim that a few personal belongings of Tom and Jackie were left back in the drawers and she wanted to return them. When Jim asked Jennifer when was the last time she saw them, she told him that it was on the day they sold the yacht. According to Jennifer, Tom and Jackie got the money from her, hopped in their car and drove away. She also told Jim that Jackie told her that their plan was to buy a house in Mexico and settle there. Jim thanked her for her input, asked her to inform him if she gets to know the whereabouts, and left. On thinking further, Jim got reminded of a woman named Patricia, who managed the finances of Tom and Jackie for the previous two years. 
While the couple spent their time in the seas, they had poor connectivity, which made it hard for them to pay their bills and taxes. So, they hired Patricia, who was a friend of theirs, to do it for them. When Jim asked her if she knew anything about where they were, she immediately told no. Jim asked her to check if a big sum of money was recently deposited in their account, but she told him nothing of that sort had happened. This actually confused both Jim and Patricia, as they couldn't find a reason for Tom and Jackie not depositing half a million dollars in their bank account. Sensing something was off, Jim called the Newport Beach Police and officially reported Tom and Jackie missing. In initial investigations revealed that Skylar Delian, who purchased the yacht from them, was already convicted of armed robbery and they grew suspicious of him. They called him over an investigation and questioned him. Skylar was extremely helpful and he told them that he liked their boat and bought it from the Hawks in front of a notary and one of his friends who acted as a witness. Similar to his wife's statements, he too told the police that the missing couple got the money from them, hopped in their SUV and drove away. When the police asked him about how he got enough money to purchase the yacht, he told them that he was a child star in the Power Rangers and he had saved up the money he gained then. But within moments, he told them that he was sorry for lying and told them that he had previously stolen the money from a drug kingpin, which was the cause for his conviction. When he came from jail, he had to launder the stolen money to make it clean and to do it, he purchased the yacht. Because of this honesty and cooperation, the police did not book him for money laundering and set him free. They investigated the remaining people who had apparently seen the couple for the last time, but all of their testimonies were similar. This led the investigation to a dead end and the police started spreading missing notices with the picture of Tom's SUV. A couple of days after putting these notices in, the police got a call from a person in Mexico who told them that the SUV in the notice was present in a house on her street. When the police rushed to this place in hopes of finding the couple, they got to know that the SUV was not parked there by Tom or Jackie, but by Skylar himself. The police investigated Skylar and Jennifer once again, but since they didn't break, they decided to investigate Skylar's friend and the notary once again. On persistent investigation, the notary named Kathleen revealed that she did not even know who Tom and Jackie was, and Skylar paid her a huge sum to forge these documents. She told them that she knew nothing of the disappearance. When they investigated Skylar's friend named Alonzo, who acted as a witness, he kept telling Skylar's narrative. But when the police told him that the notary actually confessed, and he was caught red-handed, and offered him a reduction in his punishment, he opened up. Seeing the advertisement, Skylar approached the Hawks and persuaded them into a sea trial. So, Skylar, Alonzo and another goon named John, whom Skylar had recruited just that day, turned up in front of the Hawks. Tom, who was a long-time probation officer, immediately figured out that they were actually not good people and tried to avoid the sea trial. Seeing that the Hawks were apprehensive about getting on the boat with them, Skylar called up his wife Jennifer. When Jennifer arrived with the baby, Jackie immediately started playing with the baby, and the couple became comfortable with the group, which made them agree to the sea trial. When they were about to start, Jennifer got off the boat, saying that the baby was not fond of the sea. A few moments later, Jackie and Tom understood that the group was not there for the boat, but for them. Jackie and Tom were handcuffed, and their eyes and mouths were taped by Skylar and co. Skylar forced them to sign the transfer papers, where Jackie intentionally made a mistake on his second name while signing. After getting their signatures, Skylar locked them up in a room and took the boat to the deepest part of the sea. When the boat reached this zone, Skylar brought Tom and Jackie to the back of the boat. He ordered Alonso to bring the anchor from the front of the boat. Hearing his order, Tom and Jackie understood that something wrong was going to happen. Fueled by adrenaline, Tom shook off his restraints and kicked Skylar hard on his groin. However, John jumped on both of them and connected their handcuffs to each other. With John's help, Skylar connected their handcuffs to the chain of the anchor 
and threw them into the water. As the anchor went down, it pulled the hawks along with it. While they were yanked off the boat, Jackie's head hit so hard on the boat that Alonso heard a clear cracking sound. As their bodies disappeared in the water, Skyler squealed in joy and drove the boat back to the dock. It turned out that this was actually planned by Skyler's wife, Jennifer. The couple was so cold-blooded that without any remorse, they started using the camera that Tom and Jackie used to capture their memories without even deleting the older footage. In the 1920s, there was a farmstead called Hinterkaifeck Farm, which was located in the southern part of Germany. Present in a very rural, isolated and forested area, it was occupied by the Gruber family, made up of Andreas, his wife Casilia, his daughter Victoria, and Victoria's two children, and their living maid. In the winter of 1921, strange things started happening around the property, with the first event being noticed by the living maid. One day, while she was cleaning the house, she started hearing tapping sounds from the walls. As she walked towards a nearby wall to check if someone was actually tapping on it, she understood that the tapping was not from the other side of the wall, but within the wall. As she kept focusing on the sound, she started hearing a combination of footsteps and disembodied voices from the attic. She immediately ran to Andreas and told him that someone was there in the attic. Although sceptical, Andreas walked into the attic to check if what his maid told him was true, but he found no one. In fact, the attic was so clean that it was impossible for a human being to have been there previously. The absence of hiding spots in the attic eliminated the possibility of an intruder hiding inside. So for the next few weeks, it became a routine where the maid was waking up from her sleep because of these sounds from the attic and tapping within the walls and telling Andreas that someone's in the attic, only for him to rush to the attic and find no one. With Andreas getting frustrated over time, the maid felt she had gone through enough and quit her job, claiming that the house was haunted. She had been with the family for so long that the family felt as if they were handicapped. A few days after the maid quit, Andreas started hearing the strange sounds from the attic and the tapping within the walls. But now... He found himself on the other side of the glass, and his family was not believing him. However, they started hearing these sounds with time, and the family started searching around the property for an intruder. As days passed by, whatever was causing these sounds started to turn violent. Random things in the house started to go missing, with the house keys being the most common. With just two sets of house keys, them going missing only to reappear later, in a completely random spot, turned out into a hassle for the family. One night, one of Andreas's grandchildren suddenly went missing. The family searched the entire property, and since no traces of her were found inside the property, they headed into the close-by forests in search of her. Despite clearing through the forest for a very long time, the kid was nowhere to be seen. When they returned to their house to call the police, they found the kid right next to the house. She looked completely lost and constantly told them that she didn't know how and why she had moved to that place. They covered her up in a blanket, took her into the house and started calming her down. When she was finally calm, they started asking her about how she ended up outside the house. While questioning his granddaughter, Andreas noted that a newspaper that he had never subscribed to was lying on the table. In fact, no one in that area subscribed to this new paper. With the strange events continuing, the family found that the lock of a box that held expensive tools was meddled with. The lock had deep cut marks that suggested that someone had tried to hack it off, but failed in their attempt. However, the family were not able to understand how they were not able to hear someone trying to cut through this lock. In the early March of 1922, a day after a heavy snowstorm, Andreas opened the back door of the house to find a trail of footsteps. These footsteps seemed to be walking towards his house, but there were no footsteps that whoever walked towards his house walked back. These footsteps suggested that someone had broken to his house, but not walked back. 
He checked his property completely, but there were no signs of an intruder. After having been tolerating this for so long, Andreas finally decided to open up about this to his neighbour. His neighbour offered them with a rifle, but he declined their offer. On the 4th of March 1922, a repairman turned up in front of the house of the Grubers, as they had booked an appointment. But despite knocking on the door multiple times, no one opened the door. As the dogs were barking, and he was able to hear the sound of appliances running, he thought that the family was inside the house and walked towards one of the windows in hopes of catching the family's attention. But even then, no one showed up. After circling the house and not getting any attention from the Grubers, he decided to finish off the work he was called for. Once he was done, he headed to the back door of the house, hoping it was not locked, but it was locked as well. Surprised by the oddity, he went to the house of Andreas' neighbour, told them what he saw, asked them to inform him if they heard anything from the family, and left. The neighbour decided to check out on the Grubers later that day, and went to their house. Similar to the repairman, they found the house locked. As they walked around the house hoping to see a family member, they found that the barn was open. They walked into the barn calling out Andreas' name, but they were greeted by his lifeless body. On 29th of March 1922, four members of the family had apparently walked into the barn one by one, unsuspectingly, as if they were lured by something only to be bludgeoned by a mattock. It appeared as if someone had something lured members of the family one by one, killed them, pulled their body to the corner, covered it in hay, and lured another member to the barn to repeat it. Their corpses indicated that they were not trying to fight back this entity when it hit them to death. Investigators were clueless about why the members walked into the barn without even a bit of suspicion, and literally offered no resistance while being killed. After killing four of the family members this way, this entity went into the house and killed the other two sleeping members in a similar way. Not to forget, two of these victims were actually small children. Although their bodies were discovered only a few days later, investigators figured out that the house was actually being inhabited until the day their bodies were found. The creepy part is that whatever killed this family lived in the family's house using their bed to sleep and food to eat while they lay dead in the house for almost five days. To add weight to this fact, the neighbours saw smoke coming out of the chimney of this house during the five days. The cash in the house, however, was still in place, which meant that this was not actually the work of a robber. And since the Grubers were not particularly well liked in the locality, tracing down a person with a motive to kill them became impossible. With over a century passing by, this case still remains obscure. Was the murderer a human or an unhuman? The answer stays a mystery. Two high school sweethearts named Keith and Diane grew up in a small rural town in Ohio and they ended up getting married. Six years after their marriage, the couple found a beautiful house back in their hometown. This house was isolated and it was located inside a forest, but Keith, being a hunter, and Diane, being a fan of forests, loved this home and ended up purchasing it. So Keith, Diane, and their four-year-old daughter, Raven, moved into this house in the woods. Keith was a welder during the day and he attended night school to prepare for an apprenticeship program. So... He was not at home during the weeknights, which meant that Diane and Raven were alone at home during the weeknights. The first couple of weeks went completely normal, with Diane getting used to being alone in the house, but she used to hear occasional scampering around the house. Every time she heard this sound, she used to peek out of the window to see what was causing this sound, but she could find nothing relevant. She just thought that it was a small animal that was loitering around and didn't pay much attention to it. One night, when Diane was doing the dishes after putting Raven to sleep, she heard the scampering sound. And just as always, she put her head near the window and peeked through its pane. As she peeked through the window, 
she noticed two golden eyes staring at her. She immediately concluded that these were the eyes of a dog that was roaming around on their property and decided to deal with it the next day. Once she was done with the dishes, she started cleaning the living room. While cleaning, she decided to see if the dog was still around and she peeked through a window in the living room. This time, she found nothing unusual, but while she was about to pull back her head, she saw the same golden eyes stare at her, which startled her, and she fell back. These eyes appeared to be those of a much taller being. Because of the internal reflections, she was not able to see clearly through the window, unless she placed her head literally on it. So, she thought she was making stuff up and continued cleaning. While cleaning, she convinced herself, thinking that even if those eyes were real, they could have been that of a tall dog. She again decided to see if this tall dog left their property, and walked towards the nearest window, which was nothing but the same kitchen window, and peeked through it. As she kept staring at the tree line, which was almost 20 feet away, a human head with golden eyes slowly appeared in front of her, staring at her throughout. She immediately separated herself from the window, and at that exact moment, she started hearing the sound of a vehicle in the driveway. As she sat down on the floor in fear, Keith opened the door. She told everything that happened until then to him, and he rushed out of the house to see what scared his wife. Despite rinsing the entire property, Keith did not even find traces of another person. Thus, He ended up thinking that the loneliness of the house was getting over his wife's mind. He got back into the house and convinced her, saying that it could have been an animal from the woods, and asked her not to worry. A month after this incident, Diane was all alone in the house with Raven yet again. After the previous incident, everything was back to normal again, and she was starting to believe that the eyes she had seen a month before were indeed the eyes of an animal. Yet again, She was in the kitchen looking out through the window right in front of her while doing the dishes. It was then she started noticing a pair of glowing eyes slowly raising up from the edge of the window. She backed up from the window, completely convinced it was an intruder. Instinctively, she ran around the house turning off all the lights to keep herself hidden. After turning off all the other lights, she finally turned off the living room lights. When she turned the lights off, and the internal reflections disappeared, she noticed a tall figure with glowing eyes standing right in front of a window before her. Seeing this figure, she immediately called 911, but by the time the police arrived, this figure had already disappeared. As the police went around the house checking for traces, and Keith entered the gates of the property, despite knowing it was wrong, he shouted at Diane for calling the cops. Even the cops confirmed that they found no traces of anyone on their property, and they left their house asking Diane to call them again, if anything else happens. Four months later, Keith and Diane had already moved on from the previous incidents, as nothing abnormal had followed. One day, Keith woke up early in the morning, and decided to get donuts for the family before they woke up. So, he stepped out of the house, got into his car, and turned it on to idle it for a few minutes, as the night was really cold. Leaving the car on idle, he started adjusting the rearview mirror. While adjusting, he noticed someone standing on the back of his car. He immediately got out of his car, and started searching for this stranger all around the place. It was now, he found himself in Diane's shoes. He found no one. However, he found traces all around the house, but they both started from and ended in his own house. Despite all this, Keith's instinct told him that the intruder should have fled into the woods. So, he called his friend Dennis, told him about the things happening on his property, and asked him to accompany him into the woods, to which he agreed. As soon as Dennis arrived, he picked up his hunting gun and ventured into the woods in search of the intruder, with Dennis. A few moments into the woods, Keith found the footprints of this intruder, and it was 14 inch long. This intruder was a bipedal creature with long legs. While following these 14 inch long footsteps, they started getting a strange feeling of being followed. 
Despite its creepiness, they continued following the traces, and it led them to a cabin. They immediately started shouting near the cabin, asking the intruder to come out and face them. But since they didn't get a response, they decided to visit this cabin later with the cops. So they walked out of the woods into a nearby road and called Keith's dad to pick them up. As soon as he arrived at the spot, Keith's dad asked them what they were doing in the middle of the road with guns. They in turn told him about the events that preceded. The moment they told him about the cabin in the woods, he said to them that he knew to whom it belonged. He told them that the owner of this cabin works in a nearby tyre shop, and hearing this, Keith drove the car directly to the tyre shop. To not let the intruder know that they knew his identity, they went into the shop disguising themselves as customers in need of tyre service. They figured out the person who serviced their tyre was indeed the intruder. The person was an old man who was extremely tall with a well-bit frame, and his name was George. However, Keith knew that the cops would not believe him because of George's old age. So he decided to go back home, capture George the next time he stalked his house, and then call the cops. But his property was never revisited by this intruder. Three months later, Dennis called Keith and told him that George had passed away. He also told him that this was the right time for them to know what was in the cabin. And even Keith felt the same way. So Dennis picked Keith up from his home and the duo headed to the cabin. On their way, they found a cop's car parked on the road. Luckily, this cop was Dennis's friend and he took them into George's cabin, saying that the cabin had a high degree of weirdness. Once inside the cabin, Keith noted that the cabin looked like it was used by a primitive man. But the creepy zone of the cabin was located behind a large screen. The area near the screen was filled with the stench of dog piss, and behind the screen was a large cell made of thick sheets of steel. This huge metal cage had fresh and old claw marks all over it, and on its farthest wall were cuffs for hands and feet made of thick metal. The orientation of these cuffs suggested that whatever was held in this cell was bipedal and huge. Keith instinctively felt that this unknown creature was the one behind the intrusions in his house. Strangely, Keith never felt stalked after George's death. I lost my job at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I've worked in private security for years, mostly covering concerts, parades, and the occasional charity event. Needless to say, there wasn't much of any of that in 2020, so I was axed. I had a few backups lined up, but it just didn't pan out. No one was hiring, and there was no opportunity for retraining. I could get started on a new education with my savings, but I figured I'd get a chance to come back to work within a few months anyway. Things took a turn for the worse when my mother was diagnosed with bone cancer. Suddenly, my plan to just sit this pandemic out got turned on its head. She needed all the help she could get, and my savings just wouldn't cover it. I needed at least a part-time job to make ends meet. Something that gave me time to stay at home and take care of her. While my mom got worse, I spent most of my days at the doctor's office. They had to schedule her for surgery immediately, along with the chemo and physical therapy. I never got a good idea of how bad it was. They wouldn't even say 50-50. Then one day, as I was reading the classifieds, a woman approached me. She was in her early 50s and had a very business-like demeanor and short blonde hair. She made a terrible first impression, looking like she wanted to rip the paper out of my hands and scold me. But that all fell away the instant she smiled at me. All she had to do was flash those pearly whites and I could suddenly imagine her standing on a porch with a tray of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Excuse me, I couldn't help noticing you were looking through the classifieds, she smiled. Do you mind me asking what line of work you're in? No, of course, I nodded. Private security, ma'am. Please, Leslie. She held out a hand, but pulled it back. No handshakes in the pandemic. It was bad enough that she wasn't wearing a mask. Leslie Bollin, I asked. Councilwoman Leslie Bollin? That's right, she said. 
sitting down on a chair across from me. And you are Emmett Marcus, I said. I work security for many of Councilman Erling's events. Erling? Then you must have a lot of experience. I do. She glanced back down at the classifieds, then back up at me. Erling was quite the character, she said. I bet you have some stories to tell. Not about my clients, ma'am. Leslie gave me a long look. I wasn't flinching. You never talk shit about your clients. Are you looking for a job, Emmett? It all looked great on paper. It was part-time, but almost paid a full salary. Some flexible hours during the weekdays. The weekends would be booked solid. I was told there'd be a lot of downtime, and that I was merely a precaution. The only thing that worried me was that I wasn't given a precise location or even instruction. Two things were clear. I was to bring my own gun, and Councilwoman Bolin wasn't the one in need of protection. A few days later, I was invited to a home. I knew for a fact she had a big family. I'd seen it on the posters around the town back in her campaigning days. Still, as soon as I got to her house, I noticed something was off. The lawn wasn't cut, and there was only one car in the driveway. All the curtains were closed. As I parked my car, I saw Leslie standing in the doorway to greet me. Sorry about the mess, she said as I walked up to her. I'm really, really counting on your discretion here. She said it jokingly, but I had the feeling there was more to it. I just smiled back at her. Of course, Leslie. She showed me inside, and my concerns grew. Stacked takeout boxes littered the living room, and there were at least eight empty wine bottles on the kitchen counter. I found myself blowing away fruit flies every few seconds, and I didn't even want to know what lurked under the carpets. I'll be honest, she said. It's been a rough couple of weeks. I understand, I said, trying to keep a straight face. I'm separating from my husband, she sighed. Not publicly yet, but it's happening. The kids are staying with him. That's rough. Yeah, she nodded. Rough. I caught her eyes wandering off down the hall. She started walking, nodding for me to come along. We stopped outside the downstairs bedroom. A dry four-leaf clover hung above the door. Some sort of childhood memorabilia. There was a flowery smell coming from the other side of the door, and I could hear a faint whooshing sound. Across the door was also the only new thing in the entire house, a sturdy bolt lock. It was installed to keep someone inside from coming out. That much was obvious. I'll explain it in a second, she said. Just be respectful. Of course. The room was illuminated by nothing but a slit in the window. The room had a single window with some sort of metal sheet screwed across, allowing only a sliver of light inside. The room itself was sparsely decorated. Nothing but a queen-sized bed, a closet, an old mirror, and a bedside table. The whooshing sound was coming from a rotating ceiling fan, and the flowery smell was coming from the floor on the right side of the bed. Dozens of dozens of roses, so dry they were practically mummified. Still, it covered the room in a nice smell, covering up the smell of the one laying in the bed. Someone lying across from the old mirror, able to see themselves all hours of the day. It was a very, very old man. He looked to be well past 90 years old, hairless, withered away, and barely breathing. There were no machines hooked up to him, no medication on the bedside table, just closed eyes, shallow breaths, and practically no muscle left on his body. He stank of sweat and ammonia. My dad... Oliver, she said. This is why you're here. I think a nurse might be more appropriate. I'm not sure I can be of much use. I don't need a nurse, said Leslie, locking my eyes to hers. I'm taking care of him. What I need is someone to make sure he and I are safe. Are you expecting trouble? All I need you to do is check on him every 30 minutes or so. Be sure to turn on the lights, or you won't see him breathing. I'm sorry, but I need you to answer the question, I insisted. I can't help you if you're not telling me the full story. He gets up sometimes, sighed Leslie. He gets up 
and he gets out and he can get himself hurt. This still sounds like a job for a nurse. Do you want the job or not, Emmett? She was dead serious. I wasn't sure about any of this, but I couldn't see any way I could say no. It seemed simple enough. I just nodded. Good, she smiled. And remember to keep the door shut when you're not checking in on him. And if he starts knocking, just don't let him out. I'll deal with it when I get home. I looked back on the door bolt. There was no way he was getting out without smashing the door or tearing the metal sheet off the window. And looking at those decrepit arms, I didn't expect that to happen anytime soon. It became clear that Leslie just needed me during her off hours while she was at work. Apparently, she was having some sort of legal spat with a pharmaceutical company and she had to work uncomfortable hours at times. I found it strange that I couldn't find anything about it in the local papers, and even stranger that she refused to talk about it. The only pharmaceutical company that even had a branch nearby had been shut down for decades. That first weekend with the elderly Oliver Bolan was the worst. I was to come in every night from Thursday to Sunday, about five hours at a time. I did exactly as I was told. I put a chair in the hallway and made sure to check the room at least once every 30 minutes. Unbolt the door, turn on the lights, check her breathing. That was it, over and over. I got so bored out of my mind that I started bringing pocketbooks to read on my Saturday shift. I didn't even bother hiding it, and Leslie didn't seem to mind. Hours on end with nothing but a closed to comatose old man and a whooshing ceiling fan drive anyone insane. Then came Sunday afternoon. Leslie had just been gone for a little over an hour, and I was checking on Oliver for the second time of the day. As I turned on the lights, I recoiled. He was sitting up, staring straight ahead into the mirror across the room. Mr. Bollen, I asked, are you okay? He didn't respond, didn't even look at me. He just leaned back into the bed and closed his eyes. There was something unnatural about the way he moved, almost mechanically. I made a note to tell Leslie about it once she got back. As I was leaving the room, I almost forgot to turn the lights off. As I reached the hallway, I turned around only to see Oliver sitting upright again. This time, he was looking at me. It felt predatory in a way, like he'd been caught in the act. I just turned off the lights and saw him lean back into the bed. It was the strangest thing. Even stranger was the roses by the bed. A few of them had turned blue. Leslie came back an hour later than expected and wet as a dog. She was visibly stressed and seemed scared. She just pushed me out the door, mascara running from her eyes, and told me to come in extra the following day. I told her we should talk about Oliver, but she dismissed me. I know, she yelled. Whatever it is, I know. I started coming five days a week, Thursday to Monday. It carried on for a little over a month, and I got pretty used to it. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was going to see him sitting up the next time I opened the door. He didn't, but it felt like there was always a chance. One night, Leslie was particularly late. I found myself dozing off, only to wake up when my book slipped out of my hands and hit the floor. I'd missed one of the 30 minute checkups. I bounced to my feet and hurried to the door. As I put my hand on the door bolt, I stopped, breathing. Mr. Bollen, I said, are you up? There was a short silence, then a footstep, a big one, not two or several, just one big footstep. Something felt wrong and I put my hand on my gun. I opened the door. There he was, sleeping as always. Had I imagined it? That night seemed to carry on forever. As it was getting close to two in the morning, Leslie was still nowhere to be found. I tried calling her, but I got nothing. Not on a cell, not on her office phone, nothing. I even thought about calling her husband, but decided against it. Instead, I just tried doing my job for as long as I could. At 2.30, I got up to do another check. 
As I put my hand on the door, something touched my face. I blew it away, thinking it was another fruit fly, and I noticed something touching my hand. A single, tiny, blue leaf. Looking up above the door, I noticed the dried four-leaf clover had turned completely blue. I opened the door bolt and opened the door, only to have it stop against something. There was something heavy on the other side. Two pushes later, and I realised it was the closet. How the hell did that old man move something that large and heavy without me noticing it? Mr. Bolin, I yelled out. I'm coming in. Step by step, I pushed the door open. I got it open just enough to see that his bed was empty and that all the bedside roses had turned blue. Their leaves were scattered across the floor as if someone had stepped on them. I powered through and shoved the door open. Mr. Bollin was standing in front of the metal sheet that covered the window. There was a loud pop as the corner screw was torn off. Mr. Bollin was just standing there in the dark. The whooshing noise was gone as the ceiling fan had gone quiet. The lights didn't work and there were traces of glass spread across the bed. Mr. Bollin, I... His arms were to his side. He wasn't pulling on the metal sheet, but it was still moving. He turned around. His face was stretched to the limit as something was coming out of his mouth. It was as thick as my arm and twice as long. A dark, slick surface, like a kind of oil. It dripped onto the floor, leaving blue marks along the way. It was some kind of arm or tentacle. Before I got the chance to speak, the arms split in four. One grabbed the mirror, one grabbed the bed, and the other two stuck to the ceiling. They started swinging forward, holding holding Oliver Bollin like a macabre puppet. It was so fast, all those things moving towards me. Before I could get my gun out of my harness, he was already at the door. I stumbled backwards. The arms reached through the half-open door only to get stuck by Oliver's frail body. It looked like a snail desperately trying to break free from its shell, or a snake trying to get loose from a bag. Right there in the middle of Oliver Bollin's wide open mouth, I saw something white flashing by. An eye, or a set of teeth. My pulse didn't know what to do, and just started racing. It got so high that I barely even felt it, and I was forgetting to breathe. I got my gun out, safety off, and put myself in a firing position. It was only then that I realised I had no idea what to fire at. What was my target? That moment of hesitation allowed the thing to close in on me. It threw itself at me, tossing Oliver like a rag doll across the room, knocking over the empty bottles, slipping as it lost its grip on the hallway carpet. I just ducked, and as it went over me, we traded places. It was standing between me and the exit. I dashed upstairs, hearing the smattering of something sticky as the limbs scrambled to regain balance. It just seemed so eager to get to me. Like it was hungry, or playful. Rushing up the stairs, I took a shot. I didn't even know what to aim for. I just wanted it to stay away. I must have hit something. It was a good shot, but nothing happened. Just a large bang. I locked myself in the upstairs bathroom and backed away from the door. I heard some kind of squishy noise outside as tiny tentacles were reaching in from under and over the door. It was going to rip the entire door straight off the hinges. As the wood began to creak, I opened the bathroom window, knocking over decorative soaps and porcelain figurines. I was about to throw myself out when I felt something tugging at my leg. I didn't look back, but the smell of ammonia was overwhelming. And in the midst of panic, a voice, somewhere deep inside Oliver Bollin. Hello. It tried to pull me back. I held onto the window frame for dear life. As my shoe slipped off, I took my chance. I just fell from the second story window, landing hard on the garage roof. I made a big dent in the steel roof, tumbled off and found myself flat on a gravel path, fresh out of breath. I pulled my shoulder and banged my head, but there was too much adrenaline for me to notice. I stumbled out of my car, threw myself in the driver's seat and turned the key. As the headlights lit up, I saw Oliver Bollin in front of my car. 
He was being held up by at least six appendages, standing like a crab in the middle of the driveway. His eyes were flickering back and forth like he was dreaming. As I put the car in reverse, I noticed I was screaming. I hadn't even noticed that had started. I was just screaming my heart out and it wasn't even a conscious decision. I just had to get away, no matter the cost. I don't know if it chased me or if it just let me leave. I don't know what happened for the rest of that night. I just pushed down on the gas and put as much distance as I could between me and that godforsaken house. The next day, I found myself two towns over. With my left foot bare, I stopped at a gas station and asked to borrow their phone. I must have dropped mine somewhere during the chase, probably when I pulled my gun. I still couldn't get a hold of Leslie, and at that point, I didn't know what to do. The whole night felt surreal, like something that had never really happened. Later that day, as I was driving back home, I heard it on the news. Leslie Bollen had gone missing. I just shut up about the whole thing. The pay Leslie had given me had been a bit hush-hush and under the table, and I didn't want to risk ever coming near that house again for any reason. Besides, what if I'd accidentally shot Mr. Bollen that night? What if I'd just hallucinated? It would be comforting to imagine not having seen what I'd seen, but no, it happened. Not that long afterwards, I heard the reports that Leslie Bollen had been found dead. I think I have an idea of what killed her. I didn't earn much during my time with Leslie Bollen. I've earned enough to scrape by as I look for another job, and I get to enjoy what time I have left with my mom. She's getting progressively worse. I've spent most of my days caring for her in my home. And just a few days ago, the strangest thing happened. My aunt came by to visit my mom. We all had some coffee and cake, talked, watched movies, and spent the day together. Later that night, as my mom had fallen asleep, I noticed something on her bedside table. My aunt had brought her a vase full of tulips, beautiful red and golden flowers, her favorite colors. That night, they turned blue. I want to preface this with some facts. I don't suffer from tinnitus or any other sort of hearing impairment. I never had a brain injury and no one in my family suffers from any sort of schizophrenia or hallucination. I'm not under massive stress. I don't suffer from anxiety, depression, or any other kind of debilitating mental health issue. With that out of the way, I want to tell you about my loud dreams. I was coming home from a business trip in Minneapolis when my car broke down. I was towed to a nearby garage in this small town in the middle of nowhere. I had to stay there for a night while they fixed my car. There was an apartment to rent on one of those short-term couch-crushing apps and I got a room in a four-room apartment on the outskirts of the city. Nice place, recently renovated. It was a bit weird, though. I never actually met the landlord. I just sent the money and found the keys under the welcome mat. That night, I had the strangest dream. I was fully aware that I was sleeping, but I dreamt I was right where I was, sleeping in a bed. I remember looking around the room. After what felt like an eternity, the room opened. Someone was standing in the doorway. I was still aware that I was sleeping, so I knew it wasn't real. Still, the absurdity of it all made me uneasy. This black silhouette just looking at me, a single white eye met my gaze. Then it started to scream. It wasn't just an ordinary scream. It was a piercing shriek, like a long, drawn-out electronic feedback loop. Still, it didn't move an inch. That white eye staring at me. I could feel my eardrums vibrating, like standing next to a loudspeaker. I knew it was just a dream, but the sound was so real. It continued for hours, and I couldn't escape. I just stayed there, knowing I was asleep. I tried waking myself up, trying to force my hand to slap myself. Finally, I managed to wake myself up. My ears were still ringing. I've never felt such relief waking from a nightmare before. 
The next day, my car was ready. I got in and drove off, getting out of town as fast as possible. I've never had a dream like that before, so I was having a hard time forgetting about it. It felt like my ears were still ringing. I had to stop several times just to get my head straight, and I found myself dozing off whenever I got to a red light. Not that I was tired, but it felt like my body was still trying to understand what's happened. It was also surreal. When I got back home, I explained it all to my wife, Helen. Being a nurse, she did a routine check on me, asking me about my fluid intake, if I'd taken any painkillers, all the usual stuff. She's not the kind of person to get upset or worried for nothing, but this symptom seemed to bother her. Then again, she'd worried a lot lately. Family stuff. After about 20 minutes of checkups, I just had to stop with her a white lie. I'm fine, I said. I'll let you know if it happens again. Can we just go to sleep? Are you sure you're okay, she asked, kissing my cheek. I'm fine, I smiled, getting up from the sofa. I'll take a shower and head to bed. Are you sure it just had one eye? I gave her a concerned glance. What an odd question. That night, I took myself in nice and cosy. It had been a long drive, and I was more tired than I realised. It took me nothing but a few seconds to realise I was once again in my dream. Dreaming that I was awake, in my bedroom, with Helen next to me. I could feel my sleeping body. No, I made myself mutter. No, please. But there was no arguing. The silhouette stepped into the doorway, looking at me with that one white eye. It tilted its head. Stop, I heard myself whisper. Not again. It understood me. I know it did, but that didn't matter. Once again, it started to scream. That awful, painful feedback loop. A sound so loud, it physically hurt me. Suddenly, I was awake. Helen was gently shaking my head, staring at me. I met her eyes with a smile. The sound was gone. Instant relief. Thanks, I blurted out. Thank you. I heard it, she said. Heard it? What do you mean? I could hear it, she whispered. The sound. I heard it from your ears. The next day, there was no discussion. Helen was adamant that I went to a doctor. My ears were fine, but if I concentrated hard enough... I could still sort of imagine the sound being there. The old doctor I was seeing had trouble understanding my problem. And imagine sound hurting my ears, that made no sense. Still, he humoured me. He put a stethoscope to the side of my head. So what does it sound like, he asked. Like this electronic screech. Like this, I don't know, just this weird sound getting increasingly louder. As I concentrated and tried to remember... The old doctor recoiled. Looking at the stethoscope, he put a hand on my shoulder. Do that again, he said. I replicated the effect six times. By concentrating hard enough, I could hear the sound so loudly that it physically came out of my head. If Helen had seen it, she'd have gotten an aneurysm out of worry. Luckily, she was busy chatting it up with her colleagues in the break room. The old doctor didn't know what to make of it. When he finally put down the stethoscope, he seemed flustered. It's a variation of objective tinnitus, he said, brought on by either stress or head trauma. I've had neither, I insisted. Then it's stress, he said, matter-of-factly. Always is. He got up from his chair and moved over to his computer. He was sloppy, almost showing me the patient record of the one who came in before me. I think we're working with a pinched nerve. I'll schedule for further tests in a few days, but I think we should try the simplest and the most obvious solution first. He handed me a prescription for light blood thinners. Could it be that simple? As I stepped out into the hallway, Helen was nowhere to be found. I started looking for the break room, but the entire floor seemed like a labyrinth. Finally, I decided to just call her. I picked up my phone, scrolled down to a smiling face, and then just stopped. I felt my body stopping. Frozen, I just stared at the screen. I started falling face forward into the ground. Was I falling asleep? Right there? Right then? 
It was an out-of-body experience. My forehead took a nasty hit, but I didn't feel a thing. I could see the back of my head as if I was lying on top of myself. Down the hallways, draped in black, was the same shadowy silhouette. Behind it was a nurse, moving so slowly it was like she was running through syrup. The air rippled around her as she slowly noticed me. The black silhouette, on the other hand, didn't need any time at all. This time, I wouldn't just be woken up. I was unconscious. It was easier for me to move now. I dreamt I could stand up and move my arms and legs. It was as if the less conscious I was, the more freedom I had. I just pointed an angry finger at the silhouette. He eyed me with that one glaring white orb. This ends now, I said. This ends... It was moving. It didn't usually move, but now it did. And it was coming for me, fast. The screech exploded out of the shape, deafening me. The same terrible noise, growing louder by the second. This time, I saw the nurse down the hall cover her ears. Was the sound coming out of me so loud that even she could hear it? I didn't have the time to reflect. It was closing in fast. I could move, but the world around me didn't. I couldn't open doors or windows. It all just seemed stuck. And there, moving closer by the second, was the black silhouette with that one white eye. The sound grew louder. I finally found myself stuck in a hallway between two closed doors and the elevators. It was a dead end. The shape got closer. The sound grew louder. The sound grew so loud that my vision started to blur. And as it reached a dark hand towards me, I gasped. That, this was it. This was death. Helen had rolled me over on my back and given me a shot of adrenaline. Air shot into my lungs. The world was still filled with sounds, but that awful screech was gone. Still, the hospital had gone to shit. The fluorescent lights had started to flicker. Half a dozen car alarms were hollowing outside. The nurse down the hall was on the floor, crying, her ears bleeding. Me? I just smiled. The sound was gone. Everything was better than that screech. The... The doctor said... Objective tinnitus, I smiled. This is no fucking tinnitus, Helen sighed, leaning her head against my chest. I held her as she cried. The world around us was in ruin. They wanted me to stay overnight for observation, but Helen managed to get me out of there in two hours. They trusted her to take care of me. I had no idea what she had to say to convince that old doctor that blood thinners were useless, but it was clear that I wasn't seeing the bigger picture here. Helen insisted on driving us home, telling me there was no way she'd let me be behind the wheel of a car. I was inclined to agree. You have to tell me, she said. Did something happen on your trip? What do you mean? I asked. You have to tell me. She hit the brakes, causing the car behind us to swerve out of the way, leaning on the horn. Tell me. I know something happened. Of course, she was right. Again, I didn't want to worry her. After her brother had been in a car accident, she'd been on the verge of paranoid. It'd been horrible. Every night she sat beside me, and every night she seemed just a little bit closer to waking up. The days when she was there, they noticed the activity spiking. Five weeks, she just sat there waiting. We were dating even back then, and I remember driving up there to check on her over and over. I saw the toll it had on her. Then, when her brother finally woke up, he just wasn't the same. Eventually, he cut off all contact with the rest of the family. Since then, even the tiniest hint of something being wrong could send Helen spring into paranoia. I don't think I ever told you this, she said as cars passed us by. But I heard something from him too. What do you mean? Sounds, she yelled, coming out of him. Sounds, like with me? She nodded, leaning her head against the steering wheel. Now tell me, please. So I did. It wasn't a big deal, really. I'd been in meetings most of the day, and by night all I'd drunk was whiskey, cocktails and coffee. By the time I got back to the hotel room, I threw up. 
I was so dehydrated that my head was throbbing. But before I could drink any water, I blacked out. It was just for a few moments, but that was it. That's all there was to it. But then again, thinking about it, I could have sworn there was someone standing in the doorway behind me. That's all there was, I said. It was nothing. A few seconds. She just sat there, staring straight ahead at the open road. She didn't look at me. I think it's me, she said. First my brother, now you. It just takes a small lapse. That's all it takes. That makes no sense, I said. What do you mean? Have you listened to me, she said, looking at me with her tear-filled eyes. I mean, really listened? Every day. What are you talking about? No, I mean really, really listened. She took my face in her hands and leaned forward. Our foreheads touched. It wasn't obvious at first, but after a few seconds, I heard it. Them. Hundreds of voices far away. Screaming, shouting. Terrifying screeches and cackling laughter. It was there, just beneath the surface. All I had to do was listen. They follow me, she whispered. First, they took him. Now, they want you. What do we do? Listen, please. I listened closely. There must have been dozens of them. I could even hear the screech far off in the distance. I was so distracted, I didn't even notice her opening the passenger door or removing my seatbelt. With a swift shove, I fell out of the passenger seat. Helen took off down the road, wheels spinning from a burnout. She went straight past our exit further ahead. I just stood there by the side of the road, dumbfounded. She was gone. I had to adjust my eyes. For a few seconds, I could see them. A parade of silhouettes, all different sizes and shapes, parading down the highway. Some tall, some short, some with shining white teeth. An extra arm. One dragging what looked like the corpse of a man behind him. Another using spears instead of legs. They were barely visible, but just like the sound, I could see them more clearly by concentrating. Suddenly, to the left of me, was the silhouette with the white eye. It could easily touch me, and my heart started beating like a drum. I had to stay awake. If I fainted, it'd grab me. I had to stay lucid. I tried to count the seconds, but never got past two. I tried not to focus. I didn't want to hear its terrible sound. I closed my eyes, took deep breaths, and tried my best to fight off the panic. I could hear a faint screech coming closer to my ear. I couldn't remember any other sound in the world. My mind blanked. And suddenly, it stopped. A hand stroked my shoulder. Hello, it whispered, and left. The parade disappeared down the highway. Helen just took off, and I haven't seen her since. I think she lured them all away, and if we stay separated, it won't come back. She couldn't risk losing me like she did with her brother. What happened to him anyway? I've been trying to track her down, calling her friends and parents, but no one seems to know where she is. We've talked to the police, and they're looking for the car, but so far, there's nothing. An officer mentioned in passing that she might have gone into the woods. Apparently, that's been a thing lately. Some kind of cult thing. I just wanted to come home. I can't stand going to bed every night thinking that silhouette might have come back for me. I can't sleep knowing that it might someday return. I stand at the foot of my bed every night, anxious to lay down. I sometimes get panic attacks. Once, I just curled up in a fetal position in the shower, falling asleep out of raw exhaustion. Helen, if you're reading this, we can figure it out. Whatever happening to us, we can fix it. I know we can. These loud dreams can't go on forever.